everybody, Beard Zimmerman here. I hope you're still in good mood working from home. This is the second part of our racetrack and holding tutorial. But before we start, I would like to introduce you to a couple of books that I recently received. The first one is from my friend Jens Jelef from Widerow Airlines. He has written a new version of his book Instrument Flight Procedures. And this is a great book for anybody who's not a procedure designer or for anybody who wants to become one. I will make this book as mandatory reading before starting any hands ops basic courses because it compiles flight procedure design in a very understandable manner. Pilots out there, you know, if you have no clue how the stuff on the charts was designed when you fly them, this is what you should read now, that you're not flying so much, right? The second one is this one here, which is Mechanisms of Cross-Boundary Learning from my good friend, Dr. Professor Yoshi Nakanishi, who has an associate professorship at Nagasaki University. He is also Japanese advisor to the instrument flight procedures panel of ICAO and several of you have met him when he came to the IFP conferences to speak about how flight procedure designers learn. So this book here has some of this material that he spoke about has actually compiled in a couple of chapters. It's obviously a bit more scientific than the other one from Jens. The ISBNs you can see down below. So let's now continue with the tutorial of racetrack and holdings. I want to start drawing the holding racetrack template. And this part here is about the flight technical tolerances and the associated calculations. All right, let's open Pans Ops Part 1, Section 4, Appendix Charlie to Chapter 3, Construction of Obstacle Clearance Areas for Reversal and Holding Procedures. We go to Paragraph 3.3, .3, Protection of Racetrack and Holding Procedures. I will take you step by step through the necessary calculations that you will have to do, and I will of course explain why you calculate what you calculate, and I will take you step by step through the necessary actions in terms of drawing such a template. This is an overview of Table 143 APPC4. That shows all the necessary calculations that you will have to do to finally draw a racetrack or holding template. Now I will take you step by step through the calculations, so this is just an overview of the whole table. The header of the table describes the scenario that we're looking at. You will hear me read from the right side only to give you non-SI values of the calculation. So this scenario is about indicated airspeed 220 knots at 10,000 feet, 1 minute outbound lag and an ISA plus 15 degrees temperature. Line 1 gives you the conversion factor for calculating the true airspeed as per part 1, section 2, chapter 4, appendix of Pan's Ops. Of course you could also opt to use the formula that's presented in the very same appendix to calculate the true airspeed. Line 2 makes the actual calculation of the true airspeed. Note the asterisk that kind of gives us a hint that there might be a footnote. The footnote then tells us we could also go to part 2, section 4, chapter 1, appendix A to deduce the true airspeed. If we go there, we find this formula and think, what the heck is that? Is that a show-off formula or something? No, it's actually a formula that will consider the compressibility effect. The compressibility effect is not something that's very significant at lower altitudes. At higher altitudes, where the air density is much less, then there is a little bit of compression in the pitot tube that will distort the measurements that is made by the membrane. And for that matter, you can compensate the compressibility effect because it's a physical fact and can be calculated. As said, it's not something that you would normally calculate for low altitude holdings or initial approach racetrack procedures because it is quite insignificant at lower altitudes. Only at high altitudes 
there is a bit of a difference. Now, of course, if you don't respect the compressibility effect, you will be more conservative because you will calculate actually a faster airspeed. However, you can always program that in a spreadsheet and see what the effect of the true airspeed actually is. Good, let's continue with line three where we calculate the speed per second by taking the true airspeed and dividing it by 3600. Line 4 then calculates the rate of turn. Don't get irritated by the format of the formula in that line. It is the usual rate of turn formula that you know from your basic training, as it's shown above. The only thing is that somebody already calculated 3431 times the tangent of the 25 degree back. And as usual, we're limited to a standard rate one turn. So if the previous calculation of the rate results in a value greater than three degrees per second, we're not allowed to use that in the calculation of the radius because three degrees per second is the maximum. So if your result is greater than three degrees per second, use three degrees per second as a rate in this formula that you have on the screen now. If the calculated rate was 3 degrees or less per second, you can use the calculated value. And again, the formula has a slightly funny format because somebody already calculated 20 pi in this line. Line 6 is the ultimate no-brainer because this is the altitude in thousands of feet. Our scenario is at 10,000, so we are having a value of 10 for h. Line 7 is the Ikeo wind at 10,000 feet and it's 2h plus 47, so 2 times 10 plus 47, 67 knots in total. Line 8 is the wind speed per second. We take the wind speed in knots and divide it by 3600. Line 9 calculates the wind effect that you experience when flying a 45 degree turn. When you fly a 45 degree turn, this is going to take a number of seconds. During these seconds, you're going to be exposed to the wind. And hence, the result of the 45 degrees of turn will be an omnidirectional ambiguity of your position. And that is calculated by this formula. First, we take 45 degrees and divide it by the rate. If we divide 45 degrees by the rate, degrees per second, the result is going to be seconds. And that's the number of seconds it takes to actually make the 45 degree turn. Then we multiply it with the wind per second and the result is going to be the ambiguity. So the wind effect in the normally directional manner after 45 degrees of turn. Line 10, something easy for a change. This is the time in seconds of the outbound leg. So 60 because we have a one minute outbound. Line 11 then calculates the nominal length of the outbound leg. It takes the seconds we fly outbound and multiplies it with the speed per second and that gives you a length. Flight technical tolerances we are dealing with are reaction time, bank establishment time and heading tolerance. For reaction we make a difference between quick and slower reaction. For the bank establishment we count 5 degrees of bank established per 1 second. So if you have a 25 degree bank angle like we have here in the racetrack and holding procedures, it's going to take five seconds to establish the full bank. For simplicity, we assume straight flight until the bank is fully there. Finally, we have the heading tolerance. The pilot must be given a heading tolerance five degrees to the left and to the right when he has no track guidance. So let's first look at the fast reacting airplane. That airplane here in blue passes point A, the nominal holding fix, without any reaction time. It will take, however, 5 seconds to establish the bank. So his outbound turn is going to start 5 seconds after point A, that is point B. Then he flies the outbound turn that brings him to point H. At this point, the pilot starts the timing for the straight outbound leg. Now we're looking at the slow reacting aircraft, the aircraft in green. So when passing point A, this aircraft is going to take 6 seconds reaction time and then it will start establishing the bank, which takes 5 seconds. So it takes a full 11 seconds from A to point C where the green aircraft will start the outbound turn. Then it flies the outbound turn and ends it after 180 degrees at point G, from which it starts the timing and flies the outbound leg. 
On the outbound leg, we give the green aircraft a heading tolerance, 5 degrees to the left, which is indicated here in the film. And of course, the same would also be applied 5 degrees to the right. The heading tolerance is more significant when you apply it to point G for the green plane, as you can see. So later we will only draw the two red lines as indicated in this picture. On the outbound leg, we first look at early timing, which is related to the green air aircraft starting the timing at point G. It'll fly one minute outbound but we give him a timing tolerance of minus 10 seconds so we assume the timing is ended 10 seconds early but then the green aircraft will establish the bank to make the inbound turn and that takes another five seconds. So the total distance that the green aircraft flies from G to the early points I1 and I3 is T 60 seconds minus 10 plus 5, so a total of t minus 5. The logic of points i2 and i4, the late timing tolerance start of the inbound turn, are actually both related to the blue aircraft position. So it's related to the blue aircraft starting the timing from point H, going one minute outbound, which is t, then reacting 10 seconds late, plus 10, and establishing the bank, plus 5, so total plus 15. But we're now measuring the whole thing from G because we want to have a distance from G to I2 and I4. So we also need to add the distance between the green and the blue aircraft, or in other words, the distance between point G and point H. And that's the difference from the very beginning of the holding pattern, which was a six seconds different. So the time for the green airplane to get to I2 and I4 would be T plus 21. The blue airplane flies one minute outbound T times 10 seconds late plus 10, establishes the bank plus 5, so T plus 15, and now we add the difference between G and H, which is six seconds. So a total of T plus 21. All right, now we should have understood. So again, blue plane starts at A, reacts with zero, banks the aircraft, takes five seconds, flies the outbound turn to point H, times the outbound leg one minute, ends it late plus 10, establishes the bank plus five, then turns inbound. However, we will measure the distance from G related to the green aircraft. The green aircraft at point A takes 6 seconds reaction time, takes 5 seconds to establish the bank, then turns outbound to G from where it starts the timing. It ends the timing early, minus 10, but then takes 5 seconds to establish the bank. So it turns inbound at either I1 and I3. And you can see in the picture where the airplanes end up when they have flown the inbound turn. Now to calculate the wind effect that these aircraft will experience flying these patterns. All right, my friends, that was my second episode about holdings and racetracks. I hope you liked it. If you thought it went too fast or it was too complicated, the good thing about a video is you can watch it several times. So it's now Friday evening. It is weekend, so I wish you a very good weekend, stay healthy and see you next time. Now I want to do something different. Bye bye.